Hello, this is John Jughead Pearson at 3 a.m. in the morning this time in Osaka, Japan. Um, I was going to do only full-length records, um, but I discovered uh, over the last couple of days, over some uh, thinking, that it may be important to include the Punk House EP. Um, not only just for the EP itself, but because of the lack of major recordings between uh, Boogada and My Brain Hurts, where we both acquired uh, Brian Vermin and Dan Vapid, known as Sourcap, during this time period for Punk House. Um, and I think that's a really important period of the band. Uh, so I did take a few notes on this one, so I'm going to try to give it a little uh, background. Um, I also, over the last couple of days, have been thinking about why I'm doing this, and uh, I think ultimately I, I'm just maybe a little insecure whether I, I'm still pertinent <laughs> in any kind of uh, punk sense, um, and also just as a as a, a memory helper for me to try to uh, as I get older and facing my fiftieth birthday party coming up in February, maybe I want to uh, to bring a lot of this stuff back into my memory. Um, part of me is worried that uh, Ben might think I have some ulterior motives, and maybe I do. Um, and he might even get uh, upset at uh, the incorrect information I might give just based on my bad memory, because um, that's happened in the past. So I want to apologize for any of that. That's not my intention. Um, I guess uh, I also want to say that some of this is, is claiming back what I might have lost uh, not being in the band anymore. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to say that at the beginning of this one, because it seemed fitting for... Um, this period of time, which we're talking about, uh, I think, near the end of 88 through 89. Uh, Punk, Punk House came out, uh, was July 7th, 1989, uh, and then 1991, and then 1993. Uh, it was recorded in April of 1989. I just read that for the first time. Uh, spring. There's a lot of weird stuff going on then. So here's a little bit of the background that I wanted to fill in here. Um... The thing that uh, was important to me is acknowledging that the first two records, um, Ben and I both had uh, the same f girls' friends that were friends. Um, I had met Portia and Mickey. They went to my high school, uh, Hersey High School, um, but I was already out by that time. They were friends of David Robinson and uh, Omar Khatib, Omar who did the... Uh, cover artwork for Kill the Musicians. Um, I had met them through, I think, some football game. I think I'd gone to some Hersey football game and sort of fell for this girl, Mickey. Um, and But I was very good at approaching um, girls, so what I did was uh, I was more friends with her friend, Portia. I think I had met at a party. Uh, it was one of those weird parties where somebody in the other room was, uh, you know, having sex or some woman with a lot of other men. It was it was pretty a pretty bad scene. But me and Portia and another one of her friends just sort of hung out in the living room and talked all night, and we became pretty good friends. Um, and so what I did was arrange a sort of get together with all these people so that I could be with Mickey without actually being with her, you know, without as having to ask her out. And uh, th there's a reason for all of this, <laughs> to be telling this part of it. Um, so Ben was in that was in that gathering. I forgot who all there was. Mike, Mike Cook, a lot of really uh, cool, some cool punk people and some non-punk people were were all in this gathering. And I might have gone to a beach or something, maybe Winnetka. Um, and I was, uh, you know, trying to get close to Mickey, and there was a lot of weird stuff going on that I didn't know what, and then Ben sort of took a liking to Portia. Uh, and a while later, after me and Mickey actually got together, I discovered that uh, Portia and Mickey both liked me and that they had sort of a fight and a falling out and cried and got back together as friends. And when Portia sort of met Ben, it sort of made it all better. So it was this weird thing that uh, me and Ben actually never really talked about, but uh, our girlfriends were were friends, and it was kind of a complicated situation. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I think between 
the first record and the second record, uh, a lot of their pictures were on the, the first record on the inside. Um, I think they were sort of the catalyst for a lot of the gathering of the punks around us. I mean, Ben and I were so, I think, you know, neck deep in trying to uh, work hard to, to raise money for the band and also to, to put on the shows. Uh, we had taken over Dirty Nellies uh, with Matt Nelson. Uh, we did a lot of punk shows and uh, we were slowly handing it over to him. Um, and uh, they sort of were, these Mickey and Portia was sort of a very good gathering of, of folks. So we always had punks around us. Um, and uh, when Ben was staying in my house, uh, it was a crazy time. Um, a lot of the punks would just hang out at our house all the time. Um, so I think it was really important to, to our sort of uh, submerging ourselves into the punk scene, whereas maybe without them, we may have been a little bit more on the outside because we never seemed to really fit into the Chicago scene. But it seemed like they helped us sort of gather one around us in the suburbs. So I think that's why that was important. Um, and why I bring it up also is because when those relationships started to fall apart, um, mine completely, uh, we went on a tour to the, I think it was one of the, when we went to, to Berkeley, um, I th yeah, as Berkeley, uh, my relationship started to fall apart. So by, by the time I got back, uh, me and Mickey were broken up. And um, somewhere in this time, on this tour, we went on a tour with Sponge Tunnel, who was Russ Forster's band, who was the lead, the one who started uh, uh, Underdog Records. Um, and Ben always refers to that as a sort of a an abortion of a tour. It was a, a horrible tour. I still have pretty good memories about it. Um, but we lost Steve Cheese, and we had Warren on bass, and through Vapid, I'm pretty sure, who was just Dan Schaefer at the time from the band Generation Waste, uh, who was a big fan of the band now. I had given him a copy of Boogada, and ever since then, he was he was like he I guess he used to play it all the time and wore out the grooves in the vinyl. Um, he uh, recommended this kid uh, uh, who would be uh, Vermin, so Brian Brian Vermin. So he went on tour with us, a uh, young kid, uh, and uh, during that time, um, what I think is interesting is Ben and I beforehand, when Steve Cheese was in the band and and uh, Vinny and whoever else uh, you know went and Warren too, that uh, Ben and I were sort of still pretty close then. Um, but I think as Vermin sort of joined the band, uh, it became more of his playmate. Like Ben and Brian were always joking around, having a great time on that tour. Uh, and I sort of moved away from that. And Ben and I's relationship, I think, from that point became more of like uh, almost business partners, uh, like a mother and a father, but also like business business partners. And that tour sort of cemented that. Um, and also on that tour, uh, Ben was starting to have troubles with uh, Portia. So that actually brought him and Vermin together more because they were sort of uh, indulging in their, uh, you know, their craziness. Uh, they were, you know, flirting with a lot of women and all and, and things like that. And I was a little angry because I had broken up with Mickey and, you know, I saw him kind of trying to release some tension and I felt bad for Portia and, uh, you know, I still kind of liked it. It was all just, it's just this weird stuff. Um, but it brought those two closer together. Um, and then when we got back, uh, Warren just wasn't uh, fitting in very well. And I don't think he really wanted to do punk anymore. He was always just sitting in the back reading. I, I think he was really obsessed with like porn fiction stuff. So I think we, we used to stop at like porn stores every once in a while so he can get these novels. Uh, he wasn't even looking at like naked people. I think he, he just liked reading porn fiction. Um, and so he would just sit there and do that while we were in the van with uh, Sponge Tunnel. It was very close quarters. I think we were all in the same van. And uh, it was a little miserable. I, I agree that it was a pretty miserable tour, but I still think we did a lot of uh, good shows. And we went to the East Coast and a lot of, been to a lot of places we hadn't been to before. Um, but when we got back, Warren left the band. And um, I think it's weird that my relationship with... Dan has so many different points, like, you know, eventually the Mopes, but I guess I'd given him the first record and then also approached him about uh, joining the band. So uh, he had been in, also in a band, because uh, Brian wasn't really officially in the band, if I'm not mistaken. He and uh, Dan Schaefer, Vapid, had been in a band called The Subverts, but they had only done a couple shows. 
uh, hadn't recorded anything. So the two of them joined the band, and we rehearsed in uh, Brian Verman's basement in uh, in Addison Park, I think, in Chicago. Uh, it was a pretty cool place, and I, it's it's all over the sort of the punk house EP and any kind of pictures from that period. Um, if you really look closely at the pictures, you can see this sort of really. I think this is probably you know everyone calls the Panic, Vapid, uh, Weasel, and Jughead as the the core band like for My Brain Hurts, but I really think the happiest the band had ever been was with this combination of Vermin and and Vapid and me and Ben. Um, just from the cover of the Punk House, you could see. I mean, we're just all goofy as all get go and. And we just had a lot of fun together. Um, so that's a little bit of the background on that. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to do before I move into it. Um, no, let's whoop, 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 see. I got one more page here. Now let's just go right into yeah. Good. I think that's a good setup. And now we'll go into. Oh, by, by the way, so Portia and Ben got uh, back together. Back they were fine. And they got married and were together for quite a long time uh, before they got uh, divorced. Um, but I just wanted to uh, sort of show the importance of those relationships and how they affected the band. And something more will come up about Punk House that uh, is also a reason I brought it up, but we'll get there. Um, so I'm going to read these notes. Um, first, so the, the, let's see, okay, so Punk House was the first EP by the Chicago-based punk rock band Screeching Weasel. The EP was originally released on 7-inch vinyl with a limited pressing of 500 copies. I'm reading from the uh, wiki, which seems to have all our records, which is pretty great. Um, 500 copies, yep. Yeah. On July 7th, 1989, through Limited Potential Records. Uh, it was the band's only non-compilation release to feature drummer Brian Verman and the first to feature Dan Vapid. Uh, very true. Then known as Sewer Cap. A uh, little thing to know about Limited Potential Records is... This, uh, what was his name? Who did this? Uh, is his name here? Um, eh, it doesn't matter. It'll probably come up when, when I do some more of the history. Um, but this wasn't really a, a recording studio. It was a, a studio for recording uh, advertisements, like commercials. Uh, I think bands were in there, but it wasn't really set up to be, uh, uh, you know, recording records in there. So that's, I think that's some interesting information. Uh, the guy who, who wanted to put out the record just sort of, uh, I think, was in charge of or helping out with, uh, uh, you know, local commercials and things like that. Or uh, I'm not sure of all the details on that one. Um, there we are. Would be true in Screeching with them musically. Musically, the songs on Punk House, Punk House are in a similar vein to the band's previous album, Boogada Boogada Boogada, albeit with a rougher sound. I don't agree with that at all. I think... I think this album uh, was very different, I, this EP. I think it is a lot more personal for Ben. If you notice, uh, Boogada is a lot more goofy, I think, like the first record. Even though there's traces of songs about you know, loving Madonna or, or about that, that girl I was talking about in Sunshine, um, I think there's a lot more personal revelations that uh, Ben was having. I think a lot of this touring... Um, sort of affected him. Uh, we were all always about the band, whereas so there was a lot more material to draw, actually draw from from our lives. So I think it was crucial, this EP, in that maybe the happiness of the band uh, we got together well uh, maybe freed him to write a little bit more personal material. I could be guessing, but I re reflecting back on this EP and having just listened to it, it's a lot more honest than uh, I think anything on Boogada or the, the first record were. Um, so let's go into the second paragraph here. Uh, the EP went out of print quickly, and vocalist Ben Weasel repressed it himself on his own label, No Budget Records, in 1991 without a jacket. Yeah, I thought it was kind of lame, but I, I, get, I know his idea. He wanted it to be about the music and not about the packaging, so he just uh, put it out in the, you know, the white jacket. Um, and I think it did pretty well, but people just, you know, I, back then there was no, you know, there was no digital, so it was kind of really important for people to have that sort of, you know, the LP, the, to look at, the jacket. Um, so I wasn't really too excited about that, but I, I knew what his intention was, but it was also sort of his rebellious side against, you know, things, and, and I, I don't know, it, 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 
I didn't like it really that much. The last repress was by Selfless Records in 1993, who released it with a slightly different cover from the original. They also are the ones who put out the uh, Ramones record on a uh, sort of this weird velvet, uh, really cool pressing of the of that. And then we, I used to have the, for the longest shirt. I had a the longest time. I had a shirt with the with us in the Ramones poses from Selfless Records. And I kind of miss that shirt. It's a pretty cool cool shirt. Um. And the original track from the EP were included. Uh, okay, the song Fathead was later recorded for the group's third album, My Brain Hurts, in 1991. I thought it was a weird selection, actually. I think that song uh, actually sticks out on My Brain Hurts, but we'll talk about that song when we get to it, probably twice for the next podcast, too. Podcast, YouTube. <laughs> uh, musicians. Okay, so that's, there's that. So there's a little of the background and recording, and then I'll go into the tracking of the songs itself. After releasing their second album, Boogada Boogada Boogada, in late 1988, the band fired drummer Steve Cheese because of his unwilling to tour and replace him with Brian McQuaid. We went through this, uh, Brian Vermin, and went on to the No Showers Till Gainesville tour with the local band Sponge Tunnel. Focus Ben Weasel called the tour a minor disaster. There it is. That's where he talked it about not liking it. With the two bands arguing constantly... That might be true. I mean, Russ uh, was in Sponge Town, like I said, and he put out the record, so there might have been some tensions there. Um, and they were just a really different band from us, but I really enjoyed them. I, I was a big fan of their song, um, A Little Red Fire Engine. So every night I would watch their set. Um, well, Fudge Tunnel had originally done that song, but then Spudge Tunnel was the combination of the band Sponge and Fudge Tunnel. Um... Fish was replaced by Dan Schaefer later on, yeah, a fan of Screeching Weasel who had been the singer for various local hardcore bands. Yeah, Generation Waste was a pretty great band, but uh, what was really good about it was just was vapid. I mean, Dan wasn't playing uh, guitar at all, he was just singing, and he was such a, a very dynamic and young uh, singer at the time. Um, so me and Ben sort of liked him from the from the beginning. And he also lived down the street from Paul Russell, who did the artwork for all the records, the beginning, the, you know, the logo. So that was kind of a neat combination, too. Before starting the next tour, the band decided to record an EP and went to the Studio One in Chicago in April 1989. Mike Potential, that's his name, not his real name, founder of the fanzine Limited Potential, served as producer, engineer, and opted to release the EP on his newly founded Limited Potential Records. Weezer later, later criticized the recording quality of the EP, calling it calling Potential a terrible engineer. Well, he wasn't really an engineer, you know, he was a... And like I said, it was an advertising studio, so, yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't really last too long working with that fella. Uh, the entire EP was recorded without John Jughead's guitar due to him being stranded in downstate Illinois. Um, a little of the background of that, uh, like we had said, um, uh, it was a weird time for me because uh, me and uh, Mickey were still in the same grouping of friends, and we used to go to my friend Omar's. Uh, he had a farm uh, way out in Galena, uh, so I knew the recording was coming up, but there was this chance to get back together with her, or in my mind there was. So I was pretty obsessed with it at the time. Um, so I chose to go there instead of, uh, and, and, and hoping I would get back for the recording, but I, I really fucked up on that one, and uh, everything came out pretty horrible, and I rushed back, and I was very late for the recording. Everyone was pissed at me, and uh, I made a promise to myself never to do that again, and I had always pretty sure and I'm positive that ever since that day I have been probably one of the more responsible people in a band uh, always there on time uh, probably making sure everything is done I was always in charge of the equipment after that um, so I really felt horrible about that and uh, promised myself I would never let anything come before the band again uh, when Jack had finally made it to the sessions, the other members made him hurry recording his parts and did not notice that his guitar was out of tune with the other guitars on the recordings. Yeah, we didn't really use um, um, any kind of tuning devices. You know, me and Ben, you know, we didn't, we taught ourselves how to play, so we didn't really know anything about that. Uh, even with Phil Bonet in the studio, I don't think we did much but, uh, tuning. I think, I mean, I must have had some kind of tuner to get, originally again tuned, but we never tuned again. Um, so I don't even think we knew to listen for that, and the recording studio was so horrible sounding that, you know, we couldn't really tell until the, until it was done, and it was too late. Um, I, I even listen to it now, it doesn't really bother me. 
It doesn't it doesn't seem like it's that far out, or it kind of adds a kind of weird charm to it. Uh, Weasel, later, Weasel later admitted to writing the lyrics to the songs while he was drunk and cited this and the recording quality as why Punk House is his least favorite Screeching Weasel release. Um, I completely understand that, um, but I really think the lyrics, he's underselling his his uh, the, the meaning of the lyrics on that one. Uh, so let's get into the record. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say about the record itself. Um, I, yeah, there are also, there's a few more things. I think in general, the when we got Vermin back in the band, Vermin in the band and Vapid, we became a little, I think, tighter, a tighter of a band. I really liked working with Vapid, no matter what instrument he was playing. And Vermin was so you know fun behind the uh, drums. He also built this, he had this sort of metal, and it was actually kind of like a metal band, sort of, uh, we called it a gymnasium that he had around his drums. It was a little ridiculous, but it allowed him to like jump over the drums and and do crazy stuff. When he got naked, he would just dance up there. Um, and then, uh, then Panic did the same sort of stuff a little bit later. Um, uh, what else about that? Um, I, th I think it's definitely more melodic. I think um, going to Berkeley and meeting all of the Berkeley punks who would eventually form, uh, who were just forming Lookout Records, um, really affected uh, his writing, uh, Ben's writing. And I think having... Uh, Vapid in the band, who had a little bit more of a melodic sense too, and who had been in a hardcore beforehand in Generation Waste, that wasn't very melodic, so I think he was sort of hungering for a, more of an old school, because Suburbs was sort of an old school punk sounding band, so I think the two of them together sort of started forming a more melodic band. Um, and that's where I said, when, when Vapid came in, um, what Vermin was to him as a playmate, Vapid became uh, like a writing partner. Uh, really close. The two of them, Ben and Vapid, could, uh, you know, they talked another language when they were talking music. Uh, and that's where I think I moved farther into my position of sort of a band uh, manager on the road and sort of, uh, I was the accountant and uh, sort of just sort of making things, making sure things went okay, I think. And where Brian and, or Ben and Vermin were, you know, really good best friends and goofing around and then Vapid and Ben were uh, good writing partners. I think I was sort of balancing the band, uh, helping to keep it together, I think, in many ways. Um, so let's go through these songs. Um, Punk House, lyrics by Weasel, music by John Jughead. Wow. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know I wrote the music for that one. Huh, that's interesting. I guess I did. That's a good song. <laughs> um, yeah, so that lead in that one is mine. I think a lot of these songs are a little bit more uh, uh, like rock and roll sounding. Me and Vapid do, do a lot of, uh, you know, this simple sort of, I think, you know, the... Uh, I think that stuff sort of creeps up all over this record and also later on in Wiggle. Um, I just sort of like that uh, flat to sharp sounding thing there. So Punk House has a, has a bunch of that in it. Um, the thing about Punk House is um, it's predominantly about the continuation of the story like from Ashtray, from Boogada Boogada Boogada, about visiting uh, the punks in Berkeley. Uh, and also Ben moved from my house to uh, Doug Ward's um, place in the city, uh, which was also a punk house, a bunch of people living together. So he was sort of submerged in the idea of punk houses. But a lot of the reference in the song about Dancing with a potato in your mouth um, are references to uh, having met uh, Larry Livermore from Lookouts, he, from the Lookout Records. He was at the ashtray when we when we got there, and he was sort of entertaining his the, the younger punks. And I think he was actually had a potato in his mouth, and he got on the couch and started dancing. So that's like a literal line of something that actually happened to us in that strange uh, ashtray in Berkeley, California. Uh, let's see if there's any more notes on that one. Um, I think, yeah, that what's interesting about this, and it's, you know how Ben could be very critical of, of many, many, many things, and he sort of uses that hate or criticism uh, for humor and for for songs and for really digging in deep and and is uh, is an arguing tool and trying to, to win. A lot of things are black and white for Ben, whereas I live in sort of a gray world. I also think that's probably why he's 
has a better memory about things because he knew, you know, everything was yes or no to him. So whether his 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 memory is exactly accurate, it's accurate in his mind. So there's a lot more. This is that, and that and this is that, and this is that. Whereas I sort of live more in the gray and I think approach things more from the feeling. And so I never am quite sure whether what I what happened is what happened, but I always know that the way it felt is the way it felt. And uh, to me, that was important to me. Um, but I'd like to have a little bit of a better memory, but I just don't. Um, so, yes. Uh, so that is all about uh, our experiences with punk houses. Uh, the second song is Fathead. Um, I don't remember where that came about, but I think that was, I really think that was Vapid and Ben sort of goofing around. And maybe that made it, why it made it onto my brain hurts, because um, it's just a stupid, fun song. And I think those two may have discovered their sort of talents together, uh, creating uh, stupid, funny songs. Um, uh, the only thing I could say about that is that when... Uh, my friend Spike, who doesn't know anything about punk, uh, he's a, a water engineer. Uh, he was asking about the band and he asking what you know what's different from it from the old punk and pop punk. And I and I said, well, I think in many ways we sort of took off where the Ramones uh, took you know we're at uh, in our later in our career, but that we sort of had a little bit more social comment on our songs. So there's a little bit more. Uh, serious tones and the writing was maybe a little bit stronger like Ben's writing was stronger than maybe the Ramones uh, I think um, and, he, and he and he so he listened to uh, uh, this song uh, Fathead and said oh yeah I understand that so, yeah yeah fart in the puddle that's pretty damn smart isn't it so that's the, what I remember about that one is that the the lyric go fart in the puddle is uh, is not uh, social comment as much as it is uh, high school humor, which uh, Vapid and Ben used to love to combine with, uh, you know, that's why Joe Queer, I think all of them sort of really got into that uh, childish sort of speak of high school. Never really got out of high school. Uh, never wanted to be there, but ironically, never got out. Um, the third song is Good Morning. I, I remember Ben just being really excited about writing this song. Um, it's a really fast song, and so it was exciting to play, and it had that really great sort of breakdown and that classic cliche sort of uh, slowing down that the you know a lot of punk songs did in those days, like Youth of Today and a lot of bands. Uh, it also has that great uh, bass part that Vapid came up with that is reminiscent of uh, uh, Every Night and a couple other things. He just had a really good melodic sense, whether he's playing guitar or bass, um, and that song really shows that. Uh, the other thing I think about this song, and I, I gotta think it's probably another uh, touring song, because we always had to get up early in the morning, uh, and I remember being at one place uh, in the morning where me and Vapid were trying to sleep in this, uh, I think we were at some guy's house that was also like kicked out of the army or something, but he still had his short army haircut and big muscles, and he woke up early in the morning and s stared Vapid in the face. When Vapid opened his eyes, he said, "'Morning, sunshine!' Uh, so me and Vapid used to joke about that for, for a long time. So I think um, "Good Morning" uh, may have, may have came from a little bit of the tours we experienced. Um, but I think the other important thing about it is this thing that I call the inspirational songs. It's a weird way of saying it, but I think a lot of uh, of our popular songs uh, were sort of inspirational sounding Maybe in the chord progression. Um, you know, he, Ben likes to sing a lot about the sun, and then I also do that too, and even in blackouts. Um, there's something, there's still a dark humor involved, but the idea of talking about the sun or the morning or something bright uh, implies that there's some sort of a goal. Like there's, I'd hate to say hope, but that's the word that comes to mind. I don't like the idea of hope. But there's some sort of grasping for something positive through all the, the negative feelings or the negative thoughts you might have or the negative things that are happening to you. Um, so I really feel that song was maybe the beginning of that sort of progression of Ben's into his writing, and we would have it happen in a lot of the instrumentals, like First Day of uh, Summer and uh, also Every Night, I think, is a great example of that too, sort of a darker uh, theme but has some really, I don't know, positive... Uh, Cast a little bit of a positive uh, 
view of the future, maybe. Um, and then side two of this is uh, I Need Therapy, which, uh, once again, is Ben bringing a little bit of his experiences back in, but w through the eyes of Ramones, you know, talking about being crazy or, or needing therapy is, you know, a complete Ramon sort of uh, idea. Um, but it was also very true for Ben. I mean, he was always dealing with anxiety and, uh, you know, he had been uh, away in an institution for a while. So I think he was always, it always sort of loomed over his uh, writing, this idea of escaping this uh, anxiety or or the rebellion against people trying to force you into a certain way of being. And maybe the anxiety uh, helped his writing in many ways. Uh, eventually, later, way down the line, I'll probably get to it, uh, became really contentious between the two of us. Um, yeah, I feel bad a little bit about that, but also I think we both made mistakes. Um, then number five is I Think We're Alone Now, written by Richie Cordell, originally performed by Tommy James and the Shondells. I don't know why we did this. Um, it sounds good. I think it's a really good, as our covers go of the earlier, like, 70s bubblegum songs, I think that's probably the best one. Uh, way better than the Runaway one. I just, uh, I think we did a good job. I think mean, we just might have done it in rehearsal, and I like the sort of, you know, the drum break in it. Uh, the last song is uh, Something Wrong. Uh, there might be, there must be something wrong with us. Uh, that's another uh, tour song, and uh, another one of the sort of wanky guitar parts that I did that goes all the way through from the beginning to the end. I think I completely came up with, yeah, that part. Of, ben wrote the song and the music, but I came, I, I started doing the higher notes through the whole thing, and I, I really like the sound of that, and the did 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 in a little breakdown. Um, I wrote some notes about this song, too. Uh Led to uh, war songs, back of the end of the bad, criticize, but been a potato in your mouth. No, no, did I write something about it? Yeah, there's some lyrics here. Uh, by the way, he, he talks about uh, freaking Fred, and Fr Fred is actually uh, Russ Forrester. Um, and we would call him Fred. And there's also, once again, another 27 uh, mentioned in there, 27 bucks, and fucked up little girl, which was uh, a theme, I think, that... That girl that we met in Muskegon sort of had a really a, a, had an effect on Ben's writing, sort of experiencing the compassion of this this girl in, in her hard life. So they're all sort of mentioned in this song, um, and I think that's that's it. Uh, once again, like I said, I think this was an important point of the band, but you know Vermin never got to be on a record. And then, well, what happened after this was that. Uh, the band sort of imploded, and uh, Vermin and uh, Vapid wanted to start another band, and they started Sludgeworth. Um, so things sort of fell apart, and they left the band. And I think me and Ben stopped for a little while, and I think that'll lead into uh, the beginning of My Brain Hurts for next time. It's coming out of our first uh, major breakup. Um, and I think... I think that is it. Uh, I hope that's, you know, may, might have had some uh, information you might not have known before. I hope it wasn't too boring. Yeah. And uh, that's it. It's almost 4 a.m. here in Osaka, Japan. Thank you for listening. And next up will be uh, My Brain Hurts. I'll probably take a, a little bit more time to think about that one because that's going to be probably one that a lot of you are going to want to listen to. Uh, so thank you, and good night. And I'm going to find turning this off, so I'll say good night. Let me do that again, because now i got the button already. Thank you for this episode about Punk House, and next one will be My Brain Hurts, our first album on Lookout Records. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>